So, part two, endocrine planets. So we've seen the way the endocrine system's co coordinated by the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. So now we want to think about some of the individual glands that are coordinated. So no one wears bow ties these days, do they? In your neck, about the same position where you'd wear a bow tie. Yeah. Is the thyroid gland. So there's a central bit like this. And it's kind of shaped like a bow tie. The lobes would be about the same size. So that would be the thyroid <coughs> gland located in the neck. A lobe on either side, joined by an isthmus in the middle. So two lobes. And within each lobe of the thyroid gland, at the back, there are four smaller glands as well. One there, one there, one there, and one there. Yeah. One in each lobe towards the... Two in each lobe, one in each part of each lobe towards the back. Well, the whole gland is called the thyroid gland. And these four glands embedded in the thyroid gland are called the parathyroid glands. So there's the thyroid gland with the four parathyroid glands embedded in it. Now the thyroid gland produces thyroid hormone. And it also produces another hormone called calcitonin. Calcitonin. And the parathyroid glands produce a hormone called parathyroid hormone. So those little blue spot things? Yep, these little blue spots are the parathyroid glands. So there are four parathyroid glands, which are histiologically distinct tissue, towards the back of the thyroid gland. So really the thyroid gland is two glands in one. The parathyroid glands are in these four separate bits. So the thyroid gland is producing thyroid hormone. And what thyroid hormone does is it stimulates metabolic activity. It increases metabolic activity. So if you have more thyroid hormone, that will increase your metabolic rate. So if you don't have enough thyroid hormone, your metabolic rate will be reduced. And obviously these would be abnormal states, wouldn't they? So if there was too much, that would be hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism would be too much. That's sometimes called thyrotoxicosis. Where you get toxic effects from having too much thyroid hormone. So if the patient was hyperthyroid, 
would you expect them to put on weight or would you expect them to lose weight? They'd lose weight because the metabolic rate would be high. No, it's not the key to losing weight. But fortunately, I can tell you the key to losing weight if you want. The key to losing weight is very complicated. Do you want to listen? Right, eat less, exercise more. That's the secret. So all you've got to do... Well, if at first you don't succeed, it only goes to prove you're about average. Try again. That's the key to losing weight. Or, if this gland was underactive, can you see that will cause <coughs> hypothyroidism? And without going into details, if someone was hypothyroid, would you expect them to lose weight or put weight on? They would tend to put weight on. <coughs> and because their, meta <coughs> because their metabolism is slow, they would also feel cold. Whereas people that are hyperthyroid tend to feel hot. <coughs> now for... Hypo or hyperthyroidism, there are very simple blood tests that will tell you. So you don't, never need to guess. Very simple blood tests will inform us about the activity of our patient's thyroid glands. Now, <coughs> parathyroid hormone is one of the hormones that controls the amount of calcium in the blood. So parathyroid hormone will increase the levels of calcium in the blood. Calcitonin, produced by specialist cells in the thyroid gland, will lower the amounts of calcium in the blood. So it's massively important that plasma levels of calcium are homeostatically regulated. We don't want hypercalcemia, we don't want hypocalcemia. And one of the reasons this is so important is that calcium is necessary for the normal functioning of all muscles. So normal muscle function depends on the amount of calcium. It's an electrolyte, isn't it? It's CA++. It's electrically charged. So parathyroid hormone will increase the amount of calcium in the blood. Calcitonin will reduce the amounts of calcium in the blood. So they like counteract each other? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of coordinated, but you, some people would say that these are antagonistic. They have opposite effects. But it's not that they're fighting each other. No. It's all cleverly controlled. But, but yes, but, but yes they, they do have opposite effects, absolutely. So, for example, if someone was producing too much parathyroid hormone... And the function of parathyroid hormone is to increase the amount of calcium in the blood. Can you see that could cause hypercalcemia, which we don't want. <laughs> so abnormalities of the amount of any of these hormones will lead to endocrine <coughs> disorders. Thyroid hormone is also remarkably important when you're a fetus and when you're a child, for normal growth and development, particularly growth of the brain. So if someone doesn't have enough thyroid hormone when they're a fetus or when they're a child, they'll get what we now call paediatric hypothyroidism, or paediatric hypothyroid system, uh, paediatric hypothyroid disorder. What did we call that in the old days? Is it cretinism? Absolutely, it's cretinism. We'll produce a cretin. 
A cretin is mentally and physically immature. And once the brain fails to mature, you can give thyroid hormone afterwards, but they won't catch up. They'll remain with very often profound learning difficulties for the rest of their lives. So paediatric hypothyroidism, one to avoid. Now what parts of the world are we most prone to get children with paediatric hypothyroidism? Places far away from the sea. Mm -hmm. And what else? Places high up. So mountain areas far away from the sea. This is most likely to be a problem. So Nepal, Hindu Kush mountains, Ethiopian highlands. In the last couple of centuries, this used to be a problem in Switzerland. Although they know about it now because it's mountainous and a long way from the sea. In this country, it used to be a problem in Derbyshire and also in parts of Northern Ireland. And the reason is that to make thyroxine, you need the element called iodine. And iodine comes from the sea. So iodine's in sea salt, seaweed, sea fish. So if you don't get products from the sea, then sometimes you can get a deficiency of iodine. And we still get this in this country to some extent, perhaps. Because in the United States, they add iodine to salt, but in this country we don't. So while we don't get people with overt cretinism anymore, do we get people without normal neuro who don't develop to their maximum neurological potential because they've got a mild degree of paediatric hypothyroidism? Interesting question, isn't it? The, the answer to that question is yes, we probably do get people who don't develop because of it. Who don't develop properly because they get enough iodine, but we don't really know for sure. Right, thyroid gland. Parathyroid hormone, calcium up, calcitonin, calcium down, thyroid hormone regulating the metabolic activity of the body. Is that okay? Thyroid glands? Good. Now another endocrine gland, of course, we've already looked at. It's this gland that's got a duct. <laughs> Remember the pancreas? Head, body, tail of the pancreas. Upper part of the abdominal cavity towards the back, behind the stomach, behind the transverse colon. Now, as we noted when we did blood sugar, most of the tissues in the pancreas produce various digestive enzymes or things that will become digestive enzymes. And they leave the pancreas via a duct. That's the exocrine tissue. But in the pancreas, there's also about a million... pancreatic islets of Langerhan and they are endocrine and we're not going to do it again now but remember they contain alpha cells and beta cells they also contain delta cells. The alpha cells, of course, produce the alpha cells, of course, produce. Okay, let's skip on to the beta cells. The beta cells, of course, produce insulin. Insulin. So the alpha cells must produce glucagon. Glucagon. Glucagon 
raises blood sugar levels. Insulin lowers <coughs> blood sugar levels. So you won't see that when you'll have to go back to the video on regulation of blood sugar, won't you? But these are endocrine tissues because they are producing a hormone. The insulin and the glucagon are both endocrine hormones. They both go into the blood. They're both distributed systemically throughout the whole body and they regulate the amount of glucose in the blood, amongst other things. Move on a bit. So here and here you've got kidneys, haven't you? The kidneys, of course, are remarkably useful for many things. But who knew that the kidneys are also endocrine glands? Yeah, good. <coughs> One of you knew that, that's good. The other 48 of you are just shy. So the kidney produces a hormone called... Erythropoietin. EPO. So when there's not enough oxygen in the blood going through the kidneys, the kidneys detect that and they produce more erythropoietin. They produce more erythropoietin. The erythropoietin circulates to the red bone marrow. Remember the red bone marrow is in the epiphyses of long bones. And it's in flat bones such as the sternum, the ribs <coughs> and the pelvis. And it's also in the vertebrae. Yeah? What was it that was, it was not enough of the kidney? Oxygen. 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 Yeah. So the kidney is always monitoring the amount of oxygen going through it. If there's not enough oxygen, it responds by producing erythropoietin. The erythropoietin goes to the red bone marrow, and the red bone marrow produces, or the hemato, the the the, um, the red cell, the what do you call them? The stem cells in the bone marrow, hemopoietic stem cells. That's it. The hemopoietic stem cells in the bone marrow will produce more red blood cells. In other words, erythropoietin is stimulating the production of erythrocytes, the red blood cells. What do red blood cells carry? So if we've got, if we've got more red blood cells with the haemoglobin carrying more oxygen, What's that going to do with the amount of oxygen going to the kidneys? So then it can cut down on the erythropoietin, can't it? So again, it's homeostatically regulating red cell mass. We don't want too many red cells, do we? What do we call that? Too many red cells. Huh? Yep, yeah, well done. Polycythemia. That would be too many red cells, and we don't want not, not enough, because that would make the patient anemic. So we want just the right amount. Right, the kidneys also produce something called calcitron. Calcitron. Now, if you eat some foods, that will give you vitamins. 
And if the skin is exposed to sunlight, what vitamin will it produce? Vitamin D. Vitamin D. But unfortunately, the vitamin D in food and the vitamin D produced by the skin when it's exposed to sunlight is not much good to us. It's not an active form of vitamin D. It's like a precursor. So inactive vitamin D from the diet and from the skin goes to the kidneys and the kidney converts it into calcitrol which is the active form of vitamin D. And it's the calcitrol which then trots off and performs all the vitamin D type functions we know and love. So it'll give you healthy teeth and bones. And lack of vitamin D is now implicated in all sorts of diseases, isn't it? Lack of vitamin D is implemented in some cancers, in cardiovascular disease, multiple sclerosis. Lots of diseases are now implemented, implicated with lack of vitamin D, calcitrol. Now the kidney also produces something called renin. But people say this is an enzyme as opposed to a hormone. And I'm not going to do what that does now, but it affects the angiotensin system. The renin angiotensin system. For now, let's just notice that renin, the more renin that is produced, the higher blood pressure will be. So the amount of renin that the kidney produces or does not produce regulates blood pressure. So as well as filtering blood and making urine and doing all sorts of other clever stuff, the kidney's got endocrine functions. And the kidney kind of wears a hat. You know the kidney wears a hat? So just on top of the kidney, on both kidneys, there's a structure on top of it. In the old days it used to be called the gland above the kidneys. The suprarenal gland. Now we call it the adrenal gland. So there's two adrenal glands, one on top of each kidney. The gland on top of the kidney, the adrenal gland. Okay, can you rub the kidney off? You got that one? Is that on? Yeah. Now, the adrenal gland, one on top of each kidney. Kind of a bit of a dip in it there where it sits on top of the on top of the kidney. And you probably know that the outside of an organ is called the cortex. The outside of an organ is the cortex. So this is the cortex of the adrenal gland. Therefore, it's the adrenal cortex. The outside part of the adrenal gland. 
And the bit in the middle of an organ is called the medulla. So the inside part is called the adrenal medulla. So there's the cortex on the outside and the medulla in the middle. Now the cortex itself is in different layers. So there's a layer around the outside of the cortex here, like this, on the very outside of the cortex. And that produces a substance called aldosterone or aldosterone. So aldosterone is produced in the outer part of the adrenal cortex. <coughs> and then there's a thicker part of the adrenal cortex here. And this produces several hormones, but one of them is hydrocortisone. So aldosterone is produced by the outer part of the adrenal cortex. Then this deeper part of the adrenal cortex produces several hormones, one of which is hydrocortisone sometimes called cortisol. And then still in the adrenal cortex, but in the inner part of the adrenal cortex, there's another, another layer that produces hormones called androgens. So androgens are hormones produced in the inner part of the adrenal cortex. So there are the three layers of the adrenal cortex, the outer part of the adrenal gland, but still all in the cortex. The inner part of the adrenal gland here as we know, this is the adrenal medulla. And what this produces depends on where you live. If you live in England, it produces adrenaline. If you live in the United States, it produces exactly the same thing, but it's called epinephrine. <clears throat> so the difference between an adrenaline and epinephrine is only 3,000 miles of Atlantic Ocean. Apart from that, they are an identical molecule. It is the same thing. So, you know, we have adrenaline pens, don't we? But we don't call them that, we call them epipens. It's short for epinephrine. So adrenaline and epinephrine are the same thing. And the adrenal medulla also produces noradrenaline. Also called nor. also called norepinephrine. It's exactly the same thing. <clears throat> so this noradrenaline is the same hormone that's actually produced by the sympathetic nervous system. But it's made by specialised cells in this case 
in the adrenal medulla. So specialised cells in the adrenal medulla produce adrenaline and noradrenaline. Mostly it produces adrenaline. Most of the hormone produced by the adrenal medulla is adrenaline. And of course adrenaline stimulates the fight or flight response, doesn't it? So adrenaline will increase heart rate, it will increase stroke volume, it will increase respiratory rate, it will bronchodilate the bronchial passages, it will reduce peripheral circulation, making the person go pale. And what will it do to the pupils of the eye? Will it dilate or will it constrict? It dilates them. So the sympathetic nervous system, emergencies, exercise and excitement is going to dilate the pupils. So we mentioned, didn't we, if you look into someone's eyes and they're attracted to you, it's never happened to me, but if you did... Yeah, I know. <laughs> what would happen to their pupils? Would they constrict or dilate? They'd dilate. <laughs> Having said that, I wouldn't bet your hat on it. <laughs> but it's an indicator. Yeah. <laughs> but if it's not doing that, you can tell him off. Yeah. Right, now, androgens, androgens, the term means male type hormones, male type hormones. So androgens are hormones similar to testosterone, male type hormones. So before puberty, boys produce androgens that help to stimulate growth and development before puberty. And in fact, men produce some androgens from the adrenal cortex throughout life, and so do women. Throughout life, women produce androgens. So women also produce male-type hormones. That stimulates muscle development, so that's good, makes you big and strong. And it's also responsible for female distribution of body hair, female type distribution of body hair, so auxiliary hair, pubic hair. And then when you're old, facial hair. And big hairs growing out of your nostrils that you'll need to trim every other morning. Give me something to look forward to. And it's androgens. Listen, I'm going to tell you something profound here. It's androgens that stimulate female libido, female sex drive. So it's androgens that promote sex drive generally. Men produce millions of gallons of it from their testes, as you might surmise. But women also produce some from their adrenal cortex. So androgens are male type hormones. Now hydrocortisone and the other similar hormones produced by the adrenal cortex are stress hormones. Stress hormones. They are produced when we are stressed to facilitate or increase the probability of our survival. They're stress hormones. So when you're stressed, you'll produce more hydrocortisone. Uh, Eczema just means dermatitis. 
So eczema is caused by anything that causes inflammation of the skin. Okay. So no, if anything, hydrocortisone would tend to reduce eczema. We'll see why in a minute. Okay. So, if you're anxious and stressed, can you see that means you might need to run away from the enemy tribe? Or from an attack by saber-toothed tigers? So hydrocortisone is going to increase the amount of sugar in the blood. And if it needs to, it'll produce more sugar from proteins and lactic acid in the liver. Do you remember we did that process gluconeogenesis? Where you produce sugars from things other than carbohydrates, particularly proteins and particularly uh, lactic acid. But that's bad because can you see that means the body's starting to break down its protein reserves. But hey, this is an emergency, isn't it? We can always find some more protein to eat next week. It's stress reaction. Now, if we're chased by the enemy tribe and they don't catch us after the first three or four miles, can you see we might start to run low on blood sugar, mightn't we? But we don't want to be caught, do we? So can you see we might not need to carry on running for days? We might need to escape over a mountain range. And where the, where's the energy for that going to come from? Hmm? Chocolates. With glycogen stores? It will, but you'll finish your glycogen stores up. You'll run out of them. So the glycogen stores can maintain sugar for a while, but this could be a long chase. And it'll break down protein and fat. Yeah, protein and fat. So it will increase the amount of fats in the blood. So if we need to take emergency action, having fats in the blood is good. Because it means we can remain active for days, even if we're not lucky enough to find food. Can you see it's promoting our chances of survival? But of course, if you live in a city where you can buy biscuits any time you want, and you're stressed. You see too much fat in the blood is the last thing you want, isn't it? It's going to start clogging your arteries up, isn't it? Now, if you're stressed, it's also good to have plenty of proteins in the blood. So steroids will also break down muscle and stored protein. Sorry, hydrocortisone, which is a steroid hormone. Increasing the amount of proteins in the blood. And this is particularly useful if we have an infection. So if the stress is caused by illness, the hydrocortisone can increase the amount of protein in the blood. And that's really useful because what can you make with proteins? Muscle. You can, but what we actually need to get rid of this infection is antibodies. The immunoglobulins are the immune proteins. So if we're sick and we can't eat for a week, but we've got an infection, if we don't make the antibodies, can you see the infection will kill us? So to promote the probability of our survival, because we're stressed, the body produces hydrocortisone, that breaks down muscle, that liberates amino acids, those amino acids go in the blood, and then the B lymphocytes can use those amino acids to make immune proteins, to make the immunoglobulins. That means you get better, then when you're better you can go and find something to eat again, can't you? Isn't it clever? It's there to promote survival. And also, if you're running away from the enemy tribe and you sprain your ankle. Can you say, just a minute boys, everything's off, sprain your ankle. Well, you're going to have a spear through you before you know it, aren't you? You know, they're not going to play by a big Marquis of Queensbury rules. I mean, they're probably foreign tribes after all, you know. So if you've got a sprained ankle, can you see that's going to hurt because the inflammation causes the pain. It's inflammation that causes the pain. So if you've got a sprained ankle in a stressful situation, 
can you see you need to carry on running on it? Because otherwise we're going to get killed. So what the hydrocortisone and other hormones like this do is they inhibit the inflammatory response. They inhibit inflammation. So we can keep on running, we don't feel the pain. Uh, hydrocortisone cream would reduce inflammation in anything that causes inflammation of the skin. The question is, of course, do you want to use it? Is it appropriate? Yep. Yep, it does. It thins out the skin. Yep. And also, hydrocortisone will suppress any inflammatory condition. So it makes you look good because you can get rid of the inflammation. But very often the inflammation is there for a reason. So before we give steroid type drugs, the hydrocortisone type drugs, can you see we have to decide if the inflammation is good or bad. So for example, if someone's inhaled hot gases, so someone comes into a &E, you look in the nose and you see that the nasal hairs are singed, they're burned, because they've inhaled superheated gases. That means their airways might become inflamed. And if your airways become inflamed and swollen, can you see if you could block off? Right? Is that going to kill you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you see, in that situation, it might be good to give hydrocortisone to inhibit the inflammatory response. Does that make sense? Because it's more important to inhibit the inflammatory response because otherwise you're going to die. But suppose someone had appendicitis and we gave intravenous hydrocortisone. How would they feel? Would they feel better straight away? Yeah, within a couple of hours they'd feel a lot better. The pain would virtually go. They'd think you were brilliant. You've healed them of appendicitis in no time at all. They'd probably get up and go home. But how does that kill the infection? It doesn't. So what will probably happen is that the appendix would perforate, they'd get peritonitis, and then they would die. So you can see the clever bit is deciding when it's appropriate to inhibit inflammation. Sometimes it's appropriate, sometimes it's not, but these drugs do it, <coughs> these drugs do it big style. Aldosterone, the more aldosterone that's released, the greater the amount of sodium in the blood. So aldosterone increases the amount of sodium. So it's controlling sodium levels in the blood. That's why it's sometimes called a mineral corticoid. Mineral corticoid. You see, it's a corticoid because it comes from the adrenal cortex. And sodium's a mineral. These ones, the steroid hydrocortisone type, they're sometimes called um, glucocorticoids. Glucocorticoids. Because when they were first discovered, people realised that they controlled the amount of glucose, increase the glucose in the blood. <coughs> Good. Quite complicated really, aren't they? Three not ones. So remember the cortex and the medulla. Aldosterone, hydrocortisone, androgens, the medulla, Adrenaline, noradrenaline, epinephrine, norepinephrine. Right, five minutes and we're done this quick review. Is that okay? Quick with that? Last one we need to do.
Gonads is the collective name. Come on. It's the collective name. For ovaries. The collective name for the ovaries and the testes. Ovaries, testes. The ovaries, of course, are internal, but the testes are external because sperm like it cool. Sperm don't like being at 37 degrees centigrade in the body. Sperm are much happier for some strange reason at about 35 degrees centigrade, causing all sorts of inconvenience for the cyclist. <laughs> but that's, that's the point. They are external to lower the temperature. Now, before puberty, neither of these structures do very much. But at puberty, the ovaries start producing estrogen. And progesterone. Estrogen and progesterone. Oestrogen is produced particularly in the first half of the menstrual cycle by the developing follicle. Progesterone is produced particularly in the second half of the menstrual cycle. So at puberty, the amounts of these hormones in a girl's body start to greatly increase. And it is the oestrogens particularly, but the progesterone, progesterones also to some degree, that bring about female secondary sexual characteristics. So all the things you would expect. Development of the breasts, onset of menstruation. Development of female distribution of body hair. Female distribution of adipose tissue. And during the menstrual cycles, oestrogen is particularly responsible for increasing the vascularity and thickness of the endometrium, the inside layer. And during the second half of the menstrual cycle, that endometrium is maintained by progesterone. So oestrogen develops the endometrium, progesterone keeps it going for a couple of weeks in case there's implantation. And at the end of the menstrual cycle, when the levels of progesterone fall, menstruation will take place. Testes, of course, produce testosterone. Try again. Testosterone. T e s t o s t e r o n e. Testosterone is the main male androgen. So testosterone will bring about male puberty, 
when the testes start to develop, they produce more testosterone at the time of male puberty, bringing about male distribution of hair, muscle development, thickening of the vocal cords, and the male secondary sexual characteristics. And testosterone also increases sperm production. Quite easily producing 100 million per day. Right, so tell your next door neighbour about the main endocrine glands we've discussed, their anatomy, the hormones they produce, and what the heck they all do.